I'm deeply grateful to Dr. Dalia Weinberger and to Dr. Yitzhak Gattiner for allowing me this tremendous privilege and this tremendous honor to be able to speak in this Mokam Torah to all of you. And I am humbled to be able to share a podium with Rabbi Yisrael Reisman, especially after hearing such a brilliant and insightful and inspirational talk. I would like to begin by telling you a story that has elements of pain and anguish that is befitting the three weeks and preparation for a time when we talk of Khurban. This story happened a while ago and the gentleman asked that I shouldn't say his name and of course I'll honor that. This was a man in a shul, a very humble man. He sat in the back of his shul and he announced to the Rav that he wanted to donate a Sefer Torah. And the Rav was surprised and everyone in the shul was surprised. This was not a man of means. This was not a man who had given Stoka great amounts. He just didn't have that type of money. But he said to the Rav that he was serious. He had put together the money slowly but surely. And many of us know that to write a Sefer Torah today could cost $25,000. And so the shul got ready and they made a Hachnosa Sefer Torah with a chupa and they brought in the Sefer Torah. Afterwards, someone came over to this man and said to him, why did you give this Sefer Torah? And he said the following. When he was a young boy, 12, 13 years old, he was taken from Poland with his parents to a concentration camp. He came from a very wealthy family. But that was the last time that he saw his parents. And his parents had given him a very warm set of boots. And these boots kept him warm at night. And it happened one night, a Nazi soldier came in to the barracks and saw him with these boots and grabbed it off him, ripped it off his feet and said he was going to keep it for himself. And this fellow who I spoke to told me that he started crying and he was crying endlessly because not only was he now freezing, but this was the only connection that he had to his parents. His last connection, the gift that his parents had given him. And so after a while, he went back to that Nazi soldier. And he said to him, please give me a pair of shoes. I won't be able to exist this way. You know it's freezing. So the soldier said to him, tomorrow morning, I'll bring you a pair of shoes. And he told me the next day, the soldier brought him a pair of shoes and he held it in his hands and he looked it over and he saw that the bottom of the shoes were made out of wood. But the instep, the sole of the shoes was made out of the parchment of a Sefer Torah. The Nazis, Yamash Shemam, had cut up Sefer Torah and they had stuffed the parchment between the wood part and the leather part. And that part of the shoe that he was going to step on was part of a Sefer Torah. And he said, every day I felt I was trampling on a Sefer Torah. And I made up my mind that if I ever get out of this place, no matter how much money I have or don't have, I will save every penny that I can so that eventually I should be able to give back to the Rabbi Nishlevim a Sefer Torah with the COVID that he deserves after the COVID that I took away from his Sefer Torah. When I spoke to this man, he said to me, please, don't use my name. I haven't slept in 55 years. I am haunted every night because I trampled on a Sefer Torah. Now we can understand that this person really didn't trample a Sefer Torah. But perhaps what we have to ask ourselves in our own lives, in our public life, in our private life, are we trampling on the Sefer Torah? And that's what Yemiya Anovi cried out in Yemiya Tess, Prosecutor Allah from Yud Beis. He said, Almah of the Horet. What's the reason why Eretz Yisrael was lost? Desolate, like a desert, nobody passes by. 
Why? By Yemer Hashem, the Abish that said, Al Ozvam Estoyrosi. Because they were forsaking my Torah. Hashem Asati Lufnechem that I gave to them. Velay Shomu Bakoili. Velay Holchuba. That's what we have to ask ourselves. That's something that we have to remember every single day. Are we trampling on the Abish to say for Torah? Rav Shol Shadron used to tell me many times an incident that happened with Rav Elia Lapian and Rav Elia Lapian's family. When Rav Elia Lapian was very young, he used to get up very, very early every morning to start his Seder of Torah and Tefillah. As he got older, so his family felt that he has less koyach, and they said to him, why do you have to get up so early? Sleep a little bit later. Listen to what Rav Elia answered and will learn a perspective on life. Rav Elia said, I know after 120 years I'm going to go to Shemayim. And the Abish is going to take out the Shulchan Aruch. And he's going to open up right in the beginning. Orachayim, Simon Aleph, Sif Aleph. And it says, Yizgaber Kari. A person should strengthen himself like a lion. Lamoid Baboiker, Lavoidas Boiroi, to get up early to serve his creator. Shiehei Hu Maoire Hashachar. He is going to awaken the dawn. He says, You think when I come to Shamayim, there's only Chapman of the Esther Simon and the Esther Sif? So that's why even when he was older, he felt, how in the Shulchan Aruch is he going to fail the test at the first question? And if that's the case, if that's the perspective, then perhaps we should also look at that first simon of Shulchan Aruch. And many of us will be surprised what halacha is in simon Aleph Sif Gimel. Roi l'chol yirei shamayim. It's proper and fitting for every year Shemayim. She a Meitzar v'doyeg al churban beit hamikdash. Every year Shemayim should be saddened and concerned about the churban abayis. Imagine we get up after 120 years, we'll have an excuse maybe for the first sif. But what are we going to do about sif gimel? It's not only at the end of Shulchan Aruch and Hilchas Tishabov, but it's in the first. Simon, and perhaps as of tonight, we can begin doing something. A minig that many people don't do and we really should do, as Rabbi Yisrael mentioned. The Shlach HaKadosh writes, and it's brought in the Mishnah Bura, Shebechol Suda Yoimar Al Naroiz Bovel. Over Shabbos, over Yomim Toibim, She'ein Oimrim Tachnun, you say Shir Hamaloi. When I was preparing this talk, something struck me. I never thought about it before. Isn't it interesting that by every meal throughout the week, we're supposed to say, Al Naroiz Bovel, Shom Yoshavnu, Gambochinu, Bizochreinu, Estiyon. We mentioned the Beis Amigdash. We should be mentioning the Beis Amigdash. And I know in many camps throughout the nine days, they're mocked me that the children should say Al Naris Bavel tonight and tomorrow. The next Sudha we have, we should not to say Al Naris Bavel. Let's not to think of the Chorban every day. But it's interesting on Shabbos and on Yontif, which are days of Simcha, we also talk about the Beis Amigdash. Shehamalis Bishuv Hashem Eshiv Atziyon. So it's always about the Beis Amigdash. It's either Al Naris Bavel, the sadness. Or on days of happiness, it's Bishuv Hashem, it's Shiva Siyan. But every day, we're thinking about the Churban Yerushalayim and the building of Yerushalayim, the Churban of the Beit HaMikdash and the building of the Beit HaMikdash. I have a friend in London. His name is Sammy Hamburger. He's a wonderful younger man, lives in Golders Green, and he's involved in all types of Tzorchei Tzibor. And this story happened to him. It's interesting, I had no idea that Rabbi Yisrael was going to bring this up, but listen to how a younger man behaves. He was moving into a new home, and he wanted to have his house painted. So what does he do? Just like all of us, you get an estimate from the various painters. And finally he hears that this Irish guy, he's the best painter. Most reasonable. Now he tells over the story with the Irish accent, which I won't even begin to imitate. But you could just imagine. 
the fellow comes in and Sammy says to him, he says, you see this hallway as we walk in, as you walk in from the door, I'd like you to paint the whole wall, but there's just one square. I want you to leave it empty. So the Irish guy says to him, well, why would you want to spoil the wall? I'm going to paint the whole thing. It's going to be beautiful. He says, it's because of the temple, the temple that was destroyed. So the Irish guy says, oh, I'm sorry. I didn't hear about that. Was that, uh, where was that around here? He says, no, no, that was in Israel. Oh, he says, the holy city. I don't get the Jewish news. When did that happen? And Sammy knew that he had to say something that this guy was going to come back with a retort. Sammy says to him, it happened 2,000 years ago. So this Irish guy looks at him incredibly and he says, why can't you let bygones be bygones? And you know something? That's a kasha that only a guy could ask. And I'll tell you something very interesting. A famous posik that many of us will say, hopefully that Tishabov will be a mayad, but if not, listen to how the Dubna Magid understands a pshat in Eicha, Perik Aleph, Posik Yudbeis. The Pashat of Shad in the Pasik is Yirmiya Anavi is crying out. It shouldn't happen to you. All of you who pass by, take a look and see does anybody have pain like I have pain? And the Gemara tells us in Sanhedrin Kuvdalar Amadbez, we learn a halacha from here. Talking about a certain tragedy that he has, and he is ref- making reference to it, he should say to those who he's speaking to, Lo Aleichem, it shouldn't happen to you. But the Dubna Magid gives a nice marshal, and he says there was once a very wealthy man who had a son that was a spendthrift, and this son was spending all the money that his father had. And the father was frightened because he realized after five years he's not going to have anything. He has to wait until this kid gets mature. So what does he do? He goes and he takes all his money and he buries it under his own house so that the son shouldn't be able to find it. A month later, there's a terrible fire and the whole house is burned. And he's crying. This wealthy man is crying and he's so sad. And people come over to him and say, what's the problem? You're a wealthy guy. You'll have the money, you'll build the house again. He says, you don't understand. You can't understand the depth of this tragedy. The money was under the house. The money is all gone. That's the pshat in Loy Aleichem. Yimmy Yohanavi is telling the Goyim, Loy Aleichem, Dorach. You can't understand what happened here. You think it's an architectural building. You think it's a great edifice. You think it's a, people, a place where people congregated. That's what we lost. So, of course, if that's all it was, let bygones be bygones. But if the Beis Amigdash represented Kedusha, and if, if it represented Tahara, and if it represented unity, and if the Yerushalmi tells us, that means if the Beis Amigdash is not built today in Tov Shinun Test 1999, it's as if we destroyed it, as if it happened today. So it's not bygones be bygones. We have to be concerned, why did the Beis Amigdash, why wasn't it built today? Not only, why wasn't it built years ago? That's why we have to say, Amar is Bovel. That's why we should leave that Amar al Amar. Because it's as if it's happened just now. That's the relevancy. That only a Yid can understand. However, Zechariah Novi gives us hope. And Zechariah Novi gives us a way that we can begin to act that hopefully we can bring back the Beit HaMikdosh. In Zechar Yeches, Posik Yutes, Hashem This is what the Ebesha said. Tzayim HaRavi, V'tzayim HaChamishi, the tainus of the fourth month, which is Shivasa Batamos, the tainus of the fifth month, which is Tishabov, Tzayim HaShavi, the tainus of the seventh month, which is Tzayim Gedalia, V'tzayim ha'atziri, the tainus of the tenth month, which is l'asar b'tevis. There will be a time year l'beis Yehuda l'asosa in l'asimcha. It'll be days of happiness and, ha- and glory and rejoicing. Olamoyadim toivim. How? V'ha'emes v'ha'sholayim ehovu. And the Metzure tells us, Ubovad, she'tiyu o'yavim o'emes v'ha'sholayim. 
You have to love and you have to pursue honesty and showing. And if we can tonight make a commitment that we will improve in our MS and showing, then the words of Zechariah and Novi have a chance of happening even in our time. Because unless that's the condition that those days of Tainus will come back and be a day of Moyet. So what's the essence of Shalom? The Chavetz Chaim tells us a very beautiful word on a bracha achreina that many of us make many times a week. We all say, The Amish that creates many living beings and their deficiency. From the Lashon of Chaser. And the Chavetz Chaim asks, Why didn't the Amish make us all perfect? Wouldn't it be great if we were all perfect, everybody was able to do every little thing? That would be a perfect society. And Chavetz Chaim says just the opposite. The answer to that is, Why? To maintain the life of every being. In other words, if you have a Rebbe who needs, he's a wonderful Rebbe, but he needs food, he has to go to the farmer. If a farmer needs clothes, he has to go to the tailor. If a tailor has a child that's sick, he has to go to the doctor. If the doctor needs somebody to educate his child, he has to go back to the Rebbe. So the New York Telephone Company is right. We're all connected. And that's the reason why we're created with deficiencies. Not everybody can be a doctor. Not everybody can be a lawyer. Not everybody can be a Rosh Hashiva. Not everybody can be any other talent that anyone has. The reason that we're not created perfect is so that we should all need each other. That's the essence of being connected. That's the essence of yachtos and unity. And I'll tell you a story that happened with me that brings out what it means for Yidin to be connected from one generation to another generation. When I was in this very yeshiva, when Tervedas had actually moved from 141 South 3rd Street to this building here, it was around the year 64, 65, right around that time. And in 1966, my father, Shalom, passed away. I was 21 at the time. I had to leave the yeshiva. Most of the time I was away from the yeshiva. That's when I became a moyal, and I was supporting my mother and six younger brothers and sisters. It was very, very difficult. I don't have to tell you that when a 21-year-old kid walks into a house and the mother takes a look and the father or the grandfather says, you look so young, because I'm about to do the bris. So I say, well, what do you want? The baby's also young. So that was my only retort. But it was very, very difficult. So a few months afterwards, there was a man in my shul, Rab Chaim Israel, Mr. Hans Israel, should have a list of Ganeden. He came over to me and he said to me, Pesach, I have something for you, for you and your mother. And he took out an envelope and I counted it, it was $1,500. And I said to him, Mr. Israel, I'm not ready to take Stoka. He said, thank you very much. He said, this is not Stoka. I said, what do you mean, this? what is this? He says, this is a loan. So I said, when do I have to pay it back? He says, I will never ask you for it. Whenever you want, you'll pay it back. I said, listen, I appreciate it, but I can't accept it. I have to go home and ask my mother. I don't know if she wants to accept the loan. I go home, I say to my mother, Mom, Mr. Israel gave us money. She says, I don't want stalker. I said, Ma, it's not stalker. It's, he says it's a loan. So when do we have to pay it back? Whenever we want. Okay, on that condition, she was ready to accept it. Okay, it was very difficult in those days, so we accepted the money. Two years later, I was 23, so people were already beginning to take me. So then, we put together the money, and I go to Mr. Israel's office, and I bring him back the $1,500. And I said, remember, you said this is a loan? Here it is. He said, I'm not taking it. I said, what do you mean you're not taking it? He said, I said, you told me that it's a loan. So here I'm here to pay. He says, it is a loan. So I said, if it's a loan, so I'm paying it back. He says, sit down, I want to tell you a story. He says, do you remember a couple years ago when I was on the verge of bankruptcy? He was talking about himself, and I remember. He says, there was a man in our neighborhood, Mr. Lewinstein, who came over to me and gave me a tremendous amount of money. And I said to him what you said to me. I don't want to take stalker. He said, it's not stalker, it's a loan. So I said, so when do, when do you pay it back? So he told me, you pay it back whenever you want. And a couple years later, I had the money, and I went to bring it to him, and he didn't want to take it. And I said to him what you said to me. What do you mean you don't want to take it? You said it was a loan. He said, it is a loan. And you have to pay it, but not to me. One day, you're going to find a family that needs the money, and you'll give it to them. And when they come back to pay you, you'll tell them that you're not taking the money. 
They have to pay it, but they have to pay it to another family. And that's what my mother, Rosan Gesund, and I did. A while later, we found out about another family that needed the money, and we gave them the money. And when they came to pay it back, we told them the same thing, that it should continue on and on and on. And it continues all these wonderful years. That's unity. That's achtos of generations. Unity was symbolized by the Mishmarais. 24 divisions in Klai Yisrael. Klai Yisrael was divided into 24 parts. The Koyanim had a role. The Leviim had a role. The Yisraelim had a role. Everybody worked in harmony. And I believe, perhaps the Derech Drush, but this has to be our motto from tonight on. Just like there was unity in the Beis Amikdash, and everybody had the role that they fulfilled, we have to act like the Malachim. Each of us has to be able to inspire one the other to be Malkabal or Malchoshamayim. The nice name be Ava. And to give lovingly Rishu Zelazeh. To give everyone the capability and the willingness to fulfill their potential. I don't have to be like you and you don't have to be like me. But we each have to be the best that we can be. And we have to give the Ava, not with jealousy. Rishu Zelazeh. What? To take the talents that we're each blessed with. Lahavdish Liyotram. To make the Rabbanu Shalom holy. The Nachas Ruach, with tranquility, with friendship, the Safa Brura, with clear articulation, over the Ima, and with sweetness. One of the reasons that we have so much period in Klai Yisrael is because everybody's jealous of everybody else. Not everybody can be wealthy. Not everybody can be the Rosh Shiva. Not everybody can be the one that's going to sit up front. Klai Yisrael is not only generals, it's more soldiers than generals. But the Chulam et Kavlam Aleim Ol Machoshamayim Zemizeh, that's our Achrayas to inspire each other, that we should each fulfill the potential that we have. Based on this, I think that we can now understand three beautiful lessons from an interesting Zayar HaKadosh. The Zayar HaKadosh tells us that the word Yisrael stands for Yesh Shishim Ribui Oisiyais Latayra. There are 600,000 letters in the Torah. Why does 600,000 letters in the Torah? So it's obvious because there were 600,000 men who stood at Harsinai. So that means all of us that are descendants of those 600,000 men, we each have a letter that's ours in the Sefer Torah. That's why there were 600,000. Every person at Harsinai has a letter that's his. What happens if you come to Shul on Shabbos and one letter is missing? You have hundreds of thousands of letters in the Sefer Torah and one letter is missing. The God to Sefer Torah is possible. That means that if a person is seeing that there's another fellow that's not from, that they're not fulfilling his tafkid as a yid, shouldn't send him only to Ortameach or Eishat Torah. It's our Achrayas. Because if there's a year down the block who doesn't know what Torah and Mitzvahs are, then all of us as a collective say for Torah Apostle. Because every year that's a letter has to be there. And there's another interesting halacha. No two letters can overlap. No two letters in the Torah can touch. And to me that shows that every person has his own tafkit. Every person has his own role. And therefore again one should encourage another fellow at what he can do best. And the third interesting point, isn't it interesting that in the English language we have words that are one letter, the word I or the word A. In Kola Torah Kula there's not one word that's only one letter. I know, somebody's going to tell me how Hashem Tigmulu But that's only because it's connected to the rest of the word. The word He itself is not a word. Perhaps there's a great lesson there. That no yid can make it alone. A yid needs another yid. At least another yid. And that's the lesson of the Sefer Torah. That's the lesson of Achtos. Being together means being sensitive. Something happened in Borough Park close to two years ago. An amazing story it was told to me by somebody who was right there when it happened. When the Gay Rebbe came with Rav Steinman. So there were thousands of Gerch Sidim 
who wanted to see the Rebbe, but the Rebbe had a very tight schedule. So they made up that one night in the Masifta of Ger, from seven at night until way after midnight, people would be able to line up and they would be able to see the Rebbe. So there were so many people out the door, through the lobby, around the building, out the, around the corner. So they got boy, so we got to make a system here. This is impossible. So they made this following system. They made a number system. The older people would be given a lower number. One, two, three, four, five. And the Bachman, the younger ones, they would be given a higher number because they could wait a little longer. And that's how it was going, slowly but surely. Everybody was inching up. The, uh, the lower numbers were called. And the older people came in first. And then as this whole system is going, a man walks into the door, an alt to broch and a mensch. He comes into the door and people say to him, where are you going? He says, I'm going to see the Rebbe. He says, what do you mean you're going to see the Rebbe? There's a whole line here. You can't just walk up front. He's oblivious to everybody. And he comes up front and he knocks on the door and the Gaboyim open up the door and he says, Shul what do you want here? He says, what do you mean? I came to see the Rebbe. He says, what do you mean? There's a whole system here. He says, a system? Well, what's a system? He says, you've got to have a number. He says, do you have a number? He says, do I have a number? And he lifts, lifts up his sleeve and he shows the number that he had from the concentration camp. And everybody stepped back and they let him go first. They let him go next. That's achtos. That's sensitivity. That's understanding that people are different. Different sorrows, different backgrounds. And that's what achtos is, understanding that we're all really different. I once heard my father, Shalom, once said a terrific word out of Sheva Brachas. You could use it for anything. You'll never forget this. He once said that the word united and untied are spelled with the exact same letters. The only difference is where you put the I. Where you put the ich. If you put the ich in the wrong place, then a shul is untied, a family is untied, a community is untied, Kali Yisrael is untied. But if a person puts the ich in the right perspective, then a shul could be united, a family is united, Kali Yisrael could be united. I'll tell you an amazing story that Rav Yisbiel of Shalom told over once at a Shabbos Shuvah Drasha. And those of you who know how I tried to find out about stories before I print or tell them, I actually had the schus to speak to the person to whom this story happened. Listen to this story and then you'll see vast haste putting the ich in the right perspective. There was a couple in there, you saw, that didn't have children for many years. He was a Litvish, a fellow, no shaykh to Rebus. That was not his giddle. He wasn't raised going to Rebbe. And people said to him, why don't you go to the Nazvena Rebbe and B'nai Brak? And, and, and you'll get a brocha. It was after the summer. He saw so many of his friends with their children. It broke his heart. He decided to go to the Rebbe. So the Rebbe tells him an amazing thing. He says to him, where are you going to be, Rosh Hashanah? He says, Rosh Hashanah, I'm going to be in Tveria. You know where I live. He says, come to us. The first Aliyah, on the first day, Rosh Hashanah, Hashem Pok had a Sarah, talks about Sarah, finally had a child. A person could get mafti. You never know where the bracha could come from. Mafti talks about that Hannah had a son. She had Shmuel. He never heard of this before. But, okay, tells his wife. And they decide, Taka, they're going to come. Rosh Hashanah to be by the Nadrena Rebbe in Bnei Brak. The wife told me the story herself. He comes at night. A place packed with Sidim. Shreimlach, Bekeshez, Garplach. He's a regular guy with a regular jacket. And everybody's waiting to say Lashon HaTorbe Tzikot 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 Then all of a sudden he sees another guy who looks just like him. Regular hat, regular jacket. And misery loves company. He goes over to the guy. Says, Good job, what are you doing here? He says, The Rebbe told me to come here. He says, The Rebbe told you to come here? Why did the Rebbe tell you to come here? He says, He doesn't have children. And the Rebbe said, A person gets mafed here. It's a tremendous chus. He can't believe what the Rebbe tells us to everyone. He can't believe it. That's what the Rebbe said to him. And then he starts looking around and he starts thinking, well, how am I going to outdo all these guys? 400 guys, I never thought of it. What did the Rebbe mean? I'm going to get it free. So he's mummish, destroyed in his mind. And he goes to the Rebbe, he just says, good yontif, he can't even say anything because he doesn't know where, where, where to move. He's like caught between a rock and a hard place. So his wife told me that night he could not sleep because he knew that that other guy is waiting to get mopped but that's what he's waiting for and the next morning he dived in another shul so that that other fellow should get mopped there and that year he had a little girl and the next year he had a little boy 
The Rebbeinu Shalom saw, what did the Rebbe promise him? The Rebbe didn't tell him he was going to get mopped there. The Rebbe said, come! You never know where the bracha could happen. A person gets mopped. He didn't say he was going to get mopped there. The Rebbeinu Shalom saw where this fellow put the ich, where he put the self. He wasn't selfish. He was ready to give away that bracha to have a child to somebody else. And that's why he was zeichet to children. There's a fascinating tour in Simon Tov Kofchet. And if you look through it, you'll see there's a whole system how you can know every yontif what night of the year it's going to come out. And it works with the first letter of the Olive Bays and the last letter, Ad, Bash, Gar, Dach. You look it up in Tov Kofchet. It's fascinating. But every single year without fail, the first night, Pesach, is the night of Tisha B'Av. Every year. As a matter of fact, that's why some people eat an egg at the Seder. And I was wondering, why did the Rabbani Shalom make it? That the first night of Pesach should be the exact night of Tisha B'Av. And I think I know a reason. Listen to this word. This is the greatest word I ever heard on the Haggadah of Pesach. This, I heard this on a tape from Rabbi Isaac Bernstein from London. Listen to this genius Einfall. Rabbi Menayach writes in the Rambam, Rambam Hilchas Chometz Umatza Periches Halacha Beis. The Rambam, he tells us, Rabbi Menayach tells us, what's the reason why you dip kaifas in salt water? If you and I thought about it for a year, we'd never come up with this reason. He says, you know what the reason is? Because the brothers dipped the Xenus Patim in blood. What does that have to do with kaifas in Zalzvata? So, Rabbi, Rabbi Bernstein explains what's the Pshat of Rabbi Menoyach. A whole night we're talking about Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim. But Chazal wanted you to know, before Halach Mahanya, before Manishtana, you're talking about going out of Mitzrayim? How did you get into Mitzrayim? How did the whole goal start? The whole goal is started, you know why? Because brothers couldn't get along. Because they were fighting. Because they were Sinas Chinam. And that's the reason why we use Karbat even before the whole Seder. And then he shows something phenomenal. You look it up, it's not to be believed. Look tonight in Bereshis Lamad Zion Posse Gimel on the word Ksenes Pasim. Do you know what Rashi says on the word Ksenes Pasim? Karpas! Look it up, you won't believe it. The word Ksenes Pasim, Rashi says Karpas. Why? Kar is a soft pillow. Pas is Silk, that's what the Xenus Pasim was. It was a soft, silky type of coat. So the Xenus Pasim represented that machloikis of the brothers when they dipped it into the blood. Now we can understand. If that's how the Yidden first started in Golos, then obviously that's the reason why Pesach should be the night of Tisha B'Av. Because the Sinat Chinam started back then. And it reached its ultimate. It reached the zenith, the climax of Sinas Chinam. And then the Abishtha felt that there's no more a need for the Beis Hamikdash. Tell you an amazing story that happened with Rav Meir Lodowitz and Rav Moshe Feinstein. Rav Meir Lodowitz, all of us know, and all of us have a tremendous debt of gratitude to him for everything that he's done. The founder of Art Scroll, together with Rav Nossin. So Rav Meir used to learn in Tres Yishalayim. But even after he learned, he went out of the yeshiva, he always had a shaykhah with Rab Moshe. So he goes one afternoon, he wants to ask Rab Moshe Shaila, and he's sitting in the living room. And as he's sitting in the living room, he hears that two people are about to walk out from the room where Rab Moshe was dealing with them. And as Rab Moshe is finishing with these people, he says, we'll call one Ruben, and calls one Shimon, he says, Ruben, tell Shimon, that you moichel him. Obviously, they had Adam Achleikis, and Rav Moshe had settled it. So, Ruvain said to Rav Moshe, I'm not angry at him. The Rosh Shiva settled the problem. I have no hakpada whatsoever. Rav Moshe says, I didn't tell you to say that. I'm telling you to say that you moichel him. He says, I'm not angry at him. We're going to be friends from now on.
But Moshe said, I insist that you say you are Moicho him. So of course then the person realized that Moshe was serious dark about those words and he said, Shimon, I'm Moicho you, I'm not angry, we'll be friends. When he left, Rav Meir Zlatowicz said to the Rosh Hashiva, why was the Rosh Hashiva so mocked that the person should say he was Moicho? Rav Moshe took out the Rabbeinu B'chayi, you could look it up in Bereshis Nun, Pasuk Zion. Right over there after Yaakov Avinu died. So the brothers all of a sudden became frightened. And they thought, who knows, now Yosef is going to get even with them. Because after all, the father is not here. So the Pasuk says, Vayanachem, my son. Yosef was they get traced. He told them, don't worry, I'm not angry at you. Vayadabar alibam, and he spoke on their hearts, he said, everything is okay. Shanira Bezer, Rabbein Abachaya says, it looks like from here, Shaharam reads from Yosef. Yosef was okay with them. Mikal Mokaim Laira Inu Sheyaskir HaKosav Mechila B'Yosef. It doesn't say any place in the Pasuk that Yosef said, I'm Mechil you. Im Kain, Mesu Ba'an Sham Beloi Mechilas Yosef. Those ten brothers died without Mechila. And that's why, Hutzrach HaOinish Liyaz Basar Haruge Malchus. So that's why on Tisha B'Av, we lay that said piyot, the same one that we lay on Yom Kippur, that saw Eruk and Malchus. Why? Because the ten brothers didn't get Mechila. So never Klai Yisrael was still Shuldik. And that's why we had the Asur Eruk and Malchus. And if that's the case, then perhaps all of us tonight should think for a moment between now and Tisha B'Av. There's got to be people out there that are angry at us. Or there's got to be people out there that we are angry at them. Let us call. Let us be bold and make that call. And ask for mechila. Or say to another person that has angered you or done something against you that you're michael them. And it's not enough just to say, it's all right, we'll be friends. But to say that word, I am michael, as Rabbeinu Bechaya tells us. You know, out of town, a fellow, again, he, he begged me, I shouldn't say what town it is, because he says, everybody will know who I am. In a town, there's a fellow, a Yiddish fellow, it's happened a few months ago, he had a deli. He was standing in a deli, and a fire started, he called the fire department, the fire department came five minutes too late, and the whole place was ruined. It's two and a half months, he still hasn't built up the deli yet. He was talking to a friend of mine. And he says to the friend, he's talking, if only they would have come five minutes earlier. And then he says, as he's talking, he says, oh my. He says, you know, a week before the fire, somebody came over to me in Shul and said to me, how come you always come late to Shul? Every day you come late. And I answered him, what's the difference? At the end I come. The fire department, at the end they came. Imagine a person should be matzik all of us are dim that way. I was not spoiled from it. At the end he came, yeah, big deal. But five minutes late, look what the difference is. And you know that's what Shlem Melach tells us in Kehelas. Remember your creator. Do tshuva while you're still young. While you have the koyach, while you have the power. You may arrive until when? Don't wait until the days are bad and then it re- gets those days. I shall tell you, I have no taiva, no covet, no kin, a big deal. You're going to do a tshuva at the end. Fine, at the end I come. So the Rambam tells us in Hilchas, tshuva, Perik Beis, it's also tshuva, but it's not tshuva gemura. Most of us here are very young. And if we're young and we have the power and the strength, we, now is the time to do tshuva. Now is the time to call that person who bothered you or you bothered them and get mechila. Now when he's on his deathbed, oh, you're going to ask him for mechila at that time. Or you'll go to his cable with a minion and you'll ask him for mechila. Big deal. At the end I come. It's not enough. It's not tshuva gemura. It's not the tshuva ma'ula, as it says. The second part that Zechariah tells us is that emes v'hashalayim. Let's talk about Emes for a moment. There's a Pasik Vidarashta, Vichokarta, Vishaalta Hateh. You will seek out, investigate, and inquire well, Vihine Emes, Nochainadovar. 
One of the reasons there's so much machlekes in Klai Yisrael is because we never bother to find out the truth. If we have a sister who's had a marriage problem, of course you're going to believe my sister. My sister's going to lie to me. My brother-in-law, he's a schlock. He's the one who's the terrible one. Or if it's your brother who's in that marriage problem, my brother's a sadder. You know what he does? He would never do the thing she says. And here she's getting a lawyer, she's going to court, and everything, and you take the side. We have no right to believe anyone until you hear both sides of the story. Not a husband and a wife, not a teacher and a principal, not a principal and a parent, and not a teacher and your child. Your child comes home and tells you, the teacher never calls on me. He hates me. And of course, your child is going to lie to you. Impossible. So of course, you believe your child, and then you go to PTA, and you find out that this child is off the wall. Always making noise, always not finding the place, always cracking a joke, and you tell the teacher, it must be the kid that looks like my child. It can't be my child. I'll tell you a story this is not to be believed. I was speaking at a dinner someplace, and a lady comes over to me after the dinner. Though it was a big hall. The elevator must have been maybe 70 feet from where the hall was. From the time that we walked out of the hall till that elevator, she was in tears crying. That's how pent up and angry she was. And she says to me, Rabbi Crone, you know, you have a friend who's a principal, and he's a terrible person. He called my son refuse. Refuse means garbage. Now, I know this Machana. There's no way in his life that he's going to do such a thing. But here, this lady is in tears, and she's begging me, please get involved. I, I don't know why I got involved. I just had Rachmanis for her, and I really like this Machana. He's a wonderful principal. So I called him the next day, and I said, listen, I just want to tell you something. I don't believe one word that this lady is saying because I know you. There's no way that you could have said this. But I just want you to know, if she said it to me, she said it to 100 other people. And who knows what it's going to do to your reputation. Maybe you want to work it out with her. He says, let me tell you what happened. He says, this lady has a child who has a learning disability, but she doesn't want to admit to it. So she's trying to get him into a very special high school. A high school that's on a very high standard. So I said to her, if you let him, if you apply to that high school, he's going to be refused. So she heard refuse, refuse, and she's going around saying that he said that the kid is refuse. Unless you hear both sides of the story, you have no right to take sides even when it's a close friend. <coughs> and that's why Chazal tell us in Sanhedrin, you'll take a look in Echa. It's very interesting. Perik Aleph, Perik Beis, Perik Gimel, Perik Dal, they all go Aleph through Tav. All the Sukkim go in order. Except there's one switch. And the same switch happens in Perik Beis, Perik Gimel, and Perik Dalad. Normally, the order of the Aleph Beis is Samach, Ayin, Pei. But here the Pei goes before the Ayin. In Perik Beis, Perik Gimel, Perik Dalad. So the Gemara Sanhedrin says, Bishvil Maik and Pei La Ayin. Why was the pay put before the iron? The whole olive base is in order, except that one. And the Gemara says, "Bishvil meraglim sheamru befihem, mashleiro beinehem." They use their mouth before they use their eyes, and that's why I believe we have two eyes and one mouth. That we should look into things twice before we speak once. And that's what they didn't do. The meraglim they didn't look into what the truth was. And they used their pair. And that was the chasur. And that's why the pair says before the ayin. I want to tell you now one of the greatest verts I ever heard. It's a vert in Chinuch that Rav Schwab writes in his sefer. On Chumash, Mayan Beit Sasher Eva. It's in Pashas Nothay at the end. And he tells like this. Many of us will remember that Shimshai, his mother didn't have children for a long time. And one day the Malach comes to, Manai, to, to the mother of Shimshon, to the future mother, and says to her, Vayet, and he says to her, Vayet, Malach Hashem, uh, no, sorry. It says like this, that um, the Malach comes to uh, the wife of Manoyach and says to her, Hina hara You're going to become pregnant and you're going to have a child. Shaftim, you'd give him a zayin. And he tells her, Don't drink any wine or beer. Don't eat anything, Tome. Why? Because this child is going to be a nausea. So this lady comes home. She tells her husband, Manoya, he can't believe it. What, that's what the Malach told you? I got to hear it from the Malach myself. So what do you mean, Sasha said, what do you mean? He didn't believe his wife? What, is he going to hear from the Malach any different than he said before? So Vayeta Manoya Chal Hashem. Manoya asks Hashem. He says, please bring the Isha Kim. And sure enough, he comes. 
And, he, and Manoyach says, Yovino, Yovino, tell us, for your reino, manasa lenar yula, what are you supposed to do for this child? So the Malach says, Oh, Manoyach, mikola sharamate, alisha to shamer, everything I told your wife to do, that's what you got to do. So Rav Shlach says, what's the big kasha, and what's the big teret? He didn't change anything that he said before. But Rav Schwab said, a gavaldika einfrau. He said, this was a kasha in chinuch. Manoyach is asking the Malach, how can I raise a nozir if I'm not a nozir? I'm going to tell my child not to drink wine, and I drink wine. I'm going to tell him not to drink beer, and I drink beer. So Rav Schwab is mechadish, and the Arsameach, the Mesh Chachma says the same thing. That which he said, Mikol Asher Almati Elo Isha Tishamer, you become a Nazir. You stop drinking wine. Because that's the only way you're going to show your child how to behave, if you behave that way. And Rav Schwab writes, you tell your child to do something good that you don't yourself don't do even if you tell it to myself a hundred times you're not going to be matzliach you're not going to be matzliach you want your child to be a nozir then you have to be a nozir tell you a great story I just heard this in England at the Aguda convention a fellow comes over to me wherever I go today people say you've got to hear this story most of them I can't use, but you've got to listen to all of them because you never know. Listen to this one. The fellow comes over to me and says, you know, in Belgium there's a kindergarten. And a little kindergarten, they speak Yiddish. And the Mora wanted to teach all the kids about Shabbos. So she tells one boy, you bring in the wine. And she says, another girl, you bring in the chalas. Another boy, bring in the silverware, the, 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 the tablecloth or whatever. Wednesday morning, everything is set. So she says to the little boy, Chaimel, do the zang tati. Fine, he sits up front. All the kids sit around the table. Everything is in set. She says, Chaimo, Fangon. The kid sits back in his chair, plops his head in his back. He says, Oh, you will get a shver of Och. Do you imagine? Imagine? I imagine that's Choyke <laughs> Elyon. Where does the child get that? The terror is because that's what he sees at home. So if a father comes home on Shabbos and says the Rav's Russia was nothing, or a father says to the child, the teacher doesn't learn the right diktok, it's wrong. The teacher doesn't know what she's talking about. And he criticizes the neighbors, and he criticizes the president in the show because the air conditioning wasn't working. So then this child, when he gets older, he's going to criticize the Rabbonim and the principals, and I'll go off the Zerach, and I'll do all kinds of Mishagasen. I want to tell you something that happened right here with a boy in Brooklyn. And there's a lot of kids like this. And we cannot hide ourselves to this terrible fact of why we're sitting here hopefully to be inspired five blocks away. You know where those kids are and what they're doing in the pool shops. Baruch Hashem, at least they're under guard. So many of them off the derach. So a mother calls me a few weeks ago and she says to me, my son just cut off his payas. He's a sirich he was thrown out of yeshiva. He listens to your tapes. Please talk to him. And I said to him, I'm not a professional. There's so many guys who deal. What am I going to tell him? She says, please, he told me he's not going to anybody. And I can't even tell him I'm bringing to you. I'm gonna, I told him I'm gonna, I'll bring him someplace, but it won't be a professional. I just had such a chmonis on this woman. Fine. Fine. The kid comes to my house. Short little kid. 17, 18. It looks like he's 13, but 17-year-old kid. Angry at the world. Small little yarmulke. Of course, everything cut off. And we start talking. And, you know, I saw that he was angry. First he was sitting there. I said, do me a favor. Sit right next to me on the couch. We're on the same side, me and you. You know, I'm not here. I'm not a professional. Me and you are going to be friends. Fine. We get to talking and it's not now the time to go into the whole conversation. And he starts telling me how a Rebbe in the first grade beat him to a pulp because he had chocolate in his, in his pocket and he was sucking it in class once and the Rebbe just... And that was the beginning of the end for him. But this thing I want to tell you, which I cannot get over. He says to me, what do you think about listening to a Yankee game? So I said, I'll tell you the truth. I hope I don't get in trouble, but I don't think it's that bad. Everybody has to have an outlet. It's not the end of the world. He says, you know, my father won't let me listen to a ball game, ever. And he says, always makes fun of me. Whoa, you like the Yankees? And he says to me, you know what my father does? He goes to Radio Shack, he bought a scanner, and he stands outside people's houses, and he's listening to their conversations. That he can do? And I'll tell you the truth. After he told me about ten of those type of theorists, I put my arm around him, I started crying, and I said to him, I'll tell you the truth, if I were you, I'd also leave the house. <laughs> you can't blame a kid like that. You can't blame a child like that when he sees Steeris. And that's exactly what Rav Schwab is telling us. 
Rav Schwab is telling us, if you want it, it should be Shalom and Achva in Klal Yisrael, then you have to be that type of person. Let's just end with one more thought. We'll review and we'll end with a great story. Chazal tell us, in Tainus Chavtes Amar Aleph, Vatisa Kol the whole nation raised their voices, Vayitnu Es Koylam Vayivko Ahom Balaylahu, they cried that night when the Meraglim came back. Omar Rava, Omar Rabbi Yechanan, Oysa Yom, that was Tishabov, and the Abisha said, as we all know, you cried for no reason. I'm going to give you something to cry about. Let me tell you something about Balaturim about crying. The Balaturim in Shemois Bey's Posik Bov tells us like this. We all know the story that Moshe Rabbeinu was in the little basket. So it says like this, Vatiftach Vatireu Esayelet. She opened up and she saw the child. Vihine Nar Boicha. And the child is crying. And you know what the Balaturim says? You know who the child is? The child is Aaron. Aaron was crying. And then she said, If that child is crying, Because his brother is Bitsar. And he's crying. That's the shot of what it means that when a Yid cries, when his brother is Bitsar. We made that terrible mistake years ago. Klau Yisrael made that mistake, crying for no reason. Perhaps we should be misakim that. And maybe in Shemun we should cry about the Chorbonais that are going on today. All the Rabbonim can tell you better than me how many Shrek Lecha marriage problems there are. Did it ever occur to any of us to cry in Shemakalena for the Chorbonais of families? For the Chorbonais of those kids that come from broken homes? For the chorbonites of those kids that have gone off the derach. For the chorbonites of those girls who can't find Shaduchim and those children that are not being born in Klal Yisrael. One of the greatest problems that we face today. When you dive in Shimon Esra, go into a corner and think about the source of Klal Yisrael. That's achdos. That's caring. And maybe if we cry for what there is to cry about, then the Rabbani Shalom will bring us back that Beit HaMikdash because we cried at one point when there was nothing to cry about. And that's what Chazal tell us. Chazal tell us in Vayikra Rabba, Chof Alafei, if you did an Avera with your hands, you got to do mitzvahs with your hands. You did Avera with your eyes, you got to do mitzvahs with your eyes. You ran to some place you shouldn't have ran, then you got to do a mitzvah and run with enthusiasm. That implement which you use for an Avera, you got to use as an implement for a mitzvah. So let's review everything that we said, and we'll end with a tremendous story. Let's remember that's what Yumiya cried out to us. Why did Klal Yisrael lose Eretz Yisrael and Yerushalayim? Because Ozvu es Tairasi. Let's understand and let's think honestly to ourselves in our public lives and our private lives. Do we trample on Torah? Let's remember in the first simon of Shulchan Aruch, it tells us that we should remember the Churban, perhaps from tonight on if we have not yet eaten the Suda. Let's make a commitment that from tonight on, at least till Tisha B'Av, we'll say Al Naroiz Bovel by every Suda, and certainly on Shabbos and Yontif to say Shem Aloiz B'Shuv Hashem Ashiv Atziyon. Let's remember that only we can understand that bygones are not bygones, Lo Yalechem Oivrei Dorech. A guy can't understand, but we know the Yerushalmi, that if the Beis Amigdash wasn't built in our day, it's as if we destroyed it. Let's remember, Zechariah is telling us, Emes v'asholim ahobu. If we can only make a commitment to Emes and Sholem, then we're one step closer. Let's remember, boy in the Foshe Shrabois. That's what the Chovetz Chaim tells us. We are all created with deficiencies. Why? L'achach is behem, nefesh kolchoi. That's what unity is all about. Let it be v'chulam akablam aleim ol ma'chashamayim zemizeh. Let's inspire one the other. Let's not be jealous of one the other. Not everybody can be that wealthy about stoka. Not everybody can be that prominent person. But Klal Yisrael is made up of soldiers, not only generals. And if we're one of the soldiers, let's give kavod and chizuk and idud to each other. And let's remember that lesson that we're all a letter in a Sefer Torah. If one yid is missing, then the whole Sefer Torah is possible. No two yidin can overlap. Everybody has his own role. And certainly no word in the Torah has only one letter that symbolizes the fact that every Yid needs at least another Yid. Let's remember those beautiful stories about the Yidin who let that Yid with the number on his arm go first. 
and that fellow who was ready to give away the bracha so that the other fellow should have the child and David should bend him with his children. Let's remember that's why Pesach is the first night. Or the first night of Pesach is the same night as Tisha B'Av because Karpat, Karpat represents that Sainas Pasim, which Rashi says, on Sainas Pasim Karpat, that represents the beginning of Golis. And the ultimate part of Golis is when Kral Yisrael Nebuch lost the base of Migdash. And let's remember, we're going to make a commitment to try to be Michael others and get others to be Michael us. Because Nebuch the brothers, they didn't get Mechila, and that's why Nebuch Klai Yisrael had to suffer with Asur Arug and Malchus. And let's not forget, not at the end I come, just like the fire department comes too late. Of course they came, and they saved the other buildings, but that guy's business was lost. Let's do Tshuva while we're young, and while we have the Koyach, and while we're in the same Matav as when we did the Avera. Let's remember MS. Let's look at both sides. And if we listen to both sides, whether it's a husband or a wife or a parent or a principal, even a teacher and a child, then we'll come to the true side. And that's why we have the pay before the ayin. Let's remember what our Schwab tells us. The tremendous lesson of Chinuch. The only way Menoyah could raise Shimshon of himself would be a Nazir. And if we want to raise our children to be loving, kind, and considerate people, people that are concerned for others in Klai Yisrael, we have to be those type of people. And let's do that tikkun. That tikkun of crying, crying in our Shemin Esra. Kual Yisrael at one point cried for no reason. We should cry because there's so much to cry about. Just want to end with one of the most magnificent stories that I've ever heard in my life. This story begins in 1940. There was a man, a very chosh of a Talmud Chacham, who was a rov in a small town in Poland. His name was Rabbi Yankov Avigdar. Rabbi Yankov Avigdar had a wife and four children, two boys and two girls. And Nebuch, in 1940, they were taken to concentration camps from one camp to another camp, one ghetto to another ghetto. And Nebuch, one day, Rabbi Yankov Avigda's wife was taken out and she was shot and killed. And now this man, Rabbi Yankov Avigda, was with his four children, an Alman, and those Yusayman. And as they went from place to place where the Germans sent them from one concentration camp to the other, one day they separated the father and the two girls and they put the two sons, Yitzchak and Avram, they put them separate. And the father and the daughters wanted to go with the sons. They didn't want to be separated. They had been able to be managed to be together all those years under difficult circumstances. But the Nazi Yimashimam started beating Rabbi Yankov. And they beat him. And they said, you're going to get back to where the girls are. Because they figured that the old men and the girls were useless. And these two boys, they sent them to Mattenhausen, a labor camp. And Rabbi Yankov called out to his oldest son Yitzchak. He said, take care of your younger brother Avram Bear. Never leave him out of your sight. And that was the last words they ever heard from each other as a family. A number of years later, in 1945, these two boys managed somehow to survive those concentration camps. And they came out and they were transferred to a DP camp in Italy, in Milan. And they were emaciated and frail and pale. And they were hoping from Milan that they would eventually be able to get to Eretz Yisrael. And one day, the older of those two, Yitzchak, He's walking around this DP camp in Milan and he sees a girl and he recognizes this girl. He recognizes that's the Chazan's daughter from that town where his father was the rub. He goes over to her and says, what are you doing here? And she says, she starts crying, she says, I was separated from my husband years ago. I'm going to all the DP camps in Germany, in Poland, in, in Italy, any place. I'm trying to find out if my husband is alive. And Yitzchak, who told me the story, said he knew very well that this girl's husband, Nebuch, was killed. He saw him be killed. He saw him be buried. And how in the world was he going to tell this young woman that her search was over and that Nebuch, her husband, was dead? But he had no choice and he told it to her. She started screaming and crying as one can understand. And all the anger and all the frustration and all the emotional buildup from years of hoping against hope that her husband was alive, now it was over and she was inconsolable. And after a while, this Yitzchak Avigda said to her, listen, I know you're not going to believe me, but someday you're going to want to remarry. Let me at least give you a note that I saw that your husband died because the Rabbonim, one of the greatest problems they have today is the Aguna problem. Because unless somebody has proof that a husband died, a woman can't get married. And she said, I'll never get married. I don't want you to talk like that. I don't want the letter. Don't give it to me. And he knew. He understood. He was a man of perception. He understood that things will change with time. 
and he was concerned for her. And so the next day before she left, she was going back to Bergen-Belsen, that was another DP camp. He took a piece of paper and he wrote down, I saw this lady's husband with the name and he wrote down when he died and he wrote down how he saw he was buried and he stuffed it into her purse. And she took it along. And she went to Bergen-Belsen. She was there for three months. And then, sure enough, she met a young man who never had lost his wife and they decided that they wanted to get married. But she couldn't get married. She had to go to a rov. She had to get a heter because otherwise everybody knew she was married. So she goes to the Rav who's sitting in a house in Bergen-Belsen where all the Rabbonim are there and she says to the Rav she wants to get married. And the Rav says to her, what do you mean you want to get married? What proof do you have that, that your husband is dead? So she says, what do you mean I have a letter? Well, he says, everybody has a letter. What do you have a letter from a prominent person? You have a letter from a Chosh of a Rav, somebody that's reliable. And she says, I have a letter from a young man. And she takes the letter, she throws it down on the table of frustration in front of Rav Yankov Avigdor. And he picks up the letter and he sees that's his son. He didn't know his son is alive. He says to her, you saw my son? Where did you see this man? She said, I saw him in, Mit- in Milan, in Italy. I just saw him two, three months ago. He's the one who gave me this letter. And Rabbi Yaakov Avigda could not believe that his son had survived. He had heard nothing about them. And that afternoon when he finished with this lady, he called Dr. Yaakov Griffel, who was involved in Jewish rescue. And he said, is it true that my sons are alive? And he said, yeah, it's true. And they made arrangements, and he wasn't able to do it right away. It took a couple of weeks until Rabbi Yankov Avigda was able to go from Bergen-Belsen to the train station in Milan. And he made up that he was going to meet his two sons in Milan, in the train station. And he comes there, and there are thousands of people there. And the tumult is tremendous. And the father and the two sons, they passed each other numerous times. They didn't recognize each other because they were so emaciated and so pale and so frail. And so finally, in frustration, the father gives a call out, Yitzchok, Avram Ber, where are you? And all of a sudden, two boys come running over to him, and they embrace him, and the father finds his two sons. We are in Golas. We're in a tremendous Golas, thousands of nations, thousands of people. And we're waiting to hear that voice that the Amish should call out to us. The two sons that he's looking for is Amos and Shalim. Let us answer that call tonight from Emerson and Shalim. Let us make a commitment to Emerson and Shalim. And then the Rabbani Shalom will send his emissary, Mashiach, that will come and embrace us and tell us, my son, you can come back home. Now it's time that Tishabov should be the Moyet. If we can only learn that from tonight, then we'll be Zoycha to see what Zechariah told us. That one day these Tanesim will be Lasosain Alasimchon Moyadim Toivim. May it happen in our time. Thank you for listening.